Praise the Lord. If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. This chapter is sort of, sort of the, the who's who of faithful people in Scripture. What was it about their lives that earned them a place in this chapter? There's Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and others. What made these people commendable in this area of faith? It's important that we know the answer because verse 6 of Hebrews 11 here says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he is and that he rewards those who seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. If that's the case, I'd say that it's pretty important to have faith. But, but what does it mean to, to have faith? What is faith? What exactly does it look like? We're going to attempt to answer that question today. I've shared uh, some thoughts on biblical faith before. I felt uh, compelled to share uh, more uh, in the, the form of an entire message uh, this morning. If you, does anybody have, not get a handout that, that wants one, that needs a handout? Everybody get one? Okay, good. I have right here this jar. This is an old, um, it's an antique Burma shave jar I got from my grandma. And uh, Brother Jack, did you used to use Burma shave? I don't know. Maybe Brother Ron uh, did. Uh, you just look, You just laughed like you were familiar with it. I didn't know. But uh, this is full of, of coffee beans. I've got a bunch of coffee beans in this jar. And I'd like a few of you, take a guess. How many, how many beans do you think are in this jar? Hey, go ahead. You can just... Anybody have a guess? How many beans? How many? 899 beans. Very specific guess. That's good. Maybe I just stopped counting. I was like, you know, 900 is too much. Won't fit. 899. All right. Anybody else? What's that? 100 beans. Okay. 140. 140. 899. 140. 100. Okay. 200. 525. You know what, guys? The truth is, I don't even know how many beans are in this jar. I didn't. I didn't feel like counting it. I, I didn't want to count. If you really, if you're that curious, at the end you can come count these beans for yourself. But uh, here's the point. Here's the point. When it comes to our faith in relation to God and eternity, when it comes to our faith in in what is or is not true, do you think that it's similar to guessing how many beans are in the jar? Well, not at all, actually. Uh, Christian faith is not just a, just a stab in the dark. God's word tells us right in the beginning of this chapter, Hebrews 11, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Christian faith is, is rooted and grounded in reality and surety. Everybody, everyone has, has faith in something. No matter what they tell you, everyone has faith in something. I'm just afraid that for most people, their faith is more along the lines of guessing how many beans are in the jar and hoping that they got it right. Everybody has faith in something. And many people recognize that. You've got to have faith, people say. But what does that mean? You know, is, is any faith good faith? There's a song, I, I may have referenced it before, Song by Josh Groban. Josh Groban sings with the lyrics, Believe in what you feel inside and give your dreams the wings to fly. You have everything you need if you just believe. Is that true? Do you really have everything you need if you just believe? Or does it actually matter what you believe in? I'm here to tell you this morning that what you believe, what your faith looks like, does matter. Hebrews 11 goes down this list of people, and it talks about their faith. I think Abraham is an especially good example of someone who, who makes our truth for this morning clear. Look at, look at verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. 
And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand on the seashore. That's a lot of descendants. That's Nancy's mom and, and a lady that they used to attend church with. They were in a constant competition um, to who, who had the most grandchildren at any given time. Their children were all around the same age and, and back and forth. And then it came, she was losing and she's like, Nancy, it's all up to you. The other kids are done. And we said, sorry, we're, we're done with four. Uh, and, and, and I think she ended up losing that. But Neither one of them hold a candle to Abraham and his descendants. That's a lot of descendants. And, and God made Abraham a promise that that would be reality. It was an exercise in Abraham's faith to believe what God had promised him. He was old and childless. You remember the story? Abraham and Sarah's faith wavered a little bit during that time, didn't it? Maybe a lot. And they took matters into their own hands and, and they ended up fracturing their family and creating a whole lot of unnecessary dissension that we deal with to this day. When Abraham placed his faith in his own abilities, it fell flat. It was disastrous even. Nothing Abraham did in his own strength worked. But ultimately, he became known as a man of tremendous faith. Here he is, right here. We're, we're reading about him in the faith chapter. And Paul wrote about him in Romans chapter 4 and verse 18 when he said, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham's faith wavered momentarily when he placed it in himself. But in the big picture of Abraham's life, he placed his faith in something much bigger than himself, the God of the universe. Abraham's story teaches us that it does matter what you put your faith in. It also teaches us that faith is a matter of lifestyle, not simply the act of a moment. The Christian life must be characterized by a present living faith. And this is what that looks like. Number one, faith trusts in what God has promised. There are many clear promises that God has, has given to us in his word. God-pleasing biblical faith is, of course, faith that trusts in the truth of God's word. God's word promises us that he is good. Psalm 145 and verse 9, the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Psalm 100, verse 5, For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. God's Word promises us that He will always be with us. Isaiah 43, 2, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Psalm 23, and verse 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. God's word promises us that he will provide for us. Matthew chapter 6 and verses 31 to 33, we just quoted from this a couple of weeks ago. Do not worry saying, what shall ye eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? God has promised us life through his son, Jesus Christ. In John 
8, uh, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. God promises to answer our prayers. In Luke 11, Jesus says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. God has promised us eternal life. John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The truth is that we could keep going this morning on and on and on with promises that God has given to us, and we could read multiple scriptures for each one of them. God's word is full of promises to us, and biblical faith believes every one of them. Even the ones that haven't happened yet. Just like Abraham and all of these other heroes of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11 did. Many of them lived far longer than you or I will. Yet they endured to the end and they died in faith. And even though they did not receive what was promised in their own lifetime, they went to their graves convinced that what God had said was true. They trusted in his promises. Genuine biblical faith trusts in what God has promised. Number two, faith obeys what God has commanded. This is a big part of where faith being a lifestyle, and not just an act of the moment, a lifestyle for the Christians, where this comes in. Genuine faith obeys what God has commanded. You cannot pick and choose the promises and claims of God's word at will. You must live a life of obedience to his word. Really, obedience and faith go hand in hand. A.W. Tozer said, listen to this quote, The Bible recognizes no faith that does not lead to obedience, nor does it recognize any obedience that does not spring from faith. The two are opposite sides of the same coin. End quote. This is where the rubber meets the road when you talk about a real, genuine belief. A lot of people believe in the God of the Bible. But do they really have the biblical faith talked about in Hebrews chapter 11? I'm afraid that many Christians are, are, are like the woman who had been a staunch church member for years. She was asked, so tell me, just what do you believe? She replied, I believe what my church believes. But what does your church believe? Came the next question. Well, my church believes what I believe. And the inquirer says, since you believe what your church believes, and your church believes what you believe, what do you and your church believe? And she, without even stopping, she answered, well, we believe the same thing. Some, some vague sense of faith will not avail us of the resources available to those who genuinely live by faith. When we hear God's truth and we genuinely believe in it, it changes our hearts. It changes our lives. Genuine faith obeys what God has commanded. I don't know who authored this little verse, but it speaks well to this truth. No truth of God stored in the mind will ever meet our needs until that truth gives birth to faith and faith gives birth to deeds. You may say that you believe in the God of the Bible. You may say that you believe in Jesus Christ and even the work that he did for you on the cross. But has that belief penetrated your heart and changed your life? James says, you believe? Good for you. But even the demons believe and tremble. Faith without works or without obedience is dead. I used to preach a message when I was a youth pastor, and I've done it a couple times at different youth gatherings, where I would, I would bring up my BB gun. I would ask the students for a volunteer to, to, to hold a balloon. First of all, I'd just set the balloon somewhere like on an inanimate object, like the, like the piano. And I would stand not very far, about like this, and I'd point that BB gun. How many believe I could shoot this balloon with this BB gun? And everybody raised their hand. It's not far. Yeah, I, I could do it. And i say, okay, how many of you would be willing to come and hold this in your hand and let me shoot it and not as many but still a decent number of kids usually raised their hand and I said okay how about this how many of you be willing to come and hold that in your teeth 
and let me shoot it. And at that point, usually only about one or two, you're not supposed to say they're, they're stupid, but brave uh, young men that are out for attention probably raise their hand. In fact, I don't know if I've ever had more than pretty much just one kid. That's, I'll do it, I'll do it. And so, so I, I call him, I said, come on up here then. And I put it, I put the, he put the balloon in his teeth and I act like I took aim, of course, not even putting it actually in his direction. And I didn't even have BBs in the gun, which no one knew that yet at the time. And, and I just take a big time of being all dramatic, and then I'd, I'd stop, and I'd say, oh, the safety's on, after I'd waited forever. And you know, they're, oh, you never say, oh, my goodness, he's going to do this or not. And finally, I stop, and I say, I'm not going to do it. And I say, who believed I could shoot this balloon? And everybody's hand shoots up, and I say, no, this guy did. Because only this guy was willing to actually put the feet to his faith and come all the way up and put that balloon in his teeth and actually submit to that process of me shooting that balloon out of his mouth, which I was never going to do. I got that idea from Francis Chan, except for he actually didn't stop short. He's like, you know, I think I could actually do this. And he did it. <laughs> and uh, so that's why, I, just to avoid temptation, I didn't even bring it loaded. I didn't, uh, didn't do that. But, you know, we talk a lot about obedience in our home. We have a little chant that we say sometimes, obey without delay. Do it right away. That's right. Obey without delay. Do it right away. It's for our kids. But maybe we adults could benefit from the reminder too. I don't consider questioning or procrastination from my kids to be complete obedience. But for some reason, we expect God to tolerate that sort of behavior from us. A few weeks ago, in Sunday school, we, we talked about the contrast between David and Saul. God said, David was a man after my own heart. Saul, on the other hand, was a man after his own heart. He insisted on doing things his way rather than God's way. In 1 Samuel 15, God told Saul, Go and attack Amalek, utterly destroy all that they have, do not spare them. Saul was the instrument of God's judgment in that situation. He wasn't supposed to let anyone or anything escape. You know the story. But instead of obeying fully, Saul spared the king's life. He kept the best animals and all that was good, the Bible tells us. Then when Samuel confronted him about it, he lied. He made excuses. He insisted that he had obeyed God. He, he, he did what he wanted and he expected God to approve of his incomplete obedience. Saul gets a bad rap, and rightfully so. But how often have some of us chosen to, to not obey God completely? How many of us have been incomplete in our obedience, and then we try to convince ourselves that ah, it's, it's no big deal? We try to justify our actions, and we remind ourselves how many people there are out there that are, that are way worse than we are. But God demands total obedience. The Holy Spirit uses God's word to, to speak into our lives and to give us instruction. He expects us to honor him with complete obedience. Genuine biblical faith obeys what God has commanded. Not only does biblical faith trust in what God has promised and obey what God has commanded, faith, number three, believes what God has said. Living a life of faith means living a life wrapped up in the idea that what God has said is true. It means that nothing more and nothing less serves as the, the foundation, the, the, the bedrock of our belief system than what God has said. Of course, what God has said is, is recorded for us right here in his word. A few months back, we made the statement that you, you really can't know God outside of prayer, and you can't know him outside of his word. The Bible is, is essentially, it's a letter written to us from a loving God who created us for the very purpose of knowing him intimately. And what better way to learn about our creator than to pattern our lives after the book that was given to us for that, that very reason. There are many who claim to be people of faith, and yet, they don't spend regular time in the Word of God. If genuine faith believes what God has said, how can that be said of you if you're not all that familiar with what God has said? People of faith, Christians whose lives are characterized by 
present living faith. Spend time reading, studying, and knowing God's word. And again, just as I remind you often as I preach, I, I, I have maybe one finger out and three fingers back pointing at me. As a pastor, though, I have often run into people who know just enough about God to get themselves into trouble, into a, a theological mess in their minds. There are people who claim faith, but they don't spend time in God's word. They're really not familiar enough with the things God has said to know whether or not they really believe them or not. And so there are all kinds of faulty perspectives and misaligned ideologies that have made their way into the church world, especially as it relates to this topic of faith. Someone that we love gets sick, and so we pray for their healing, and maybe they still die. And somebody says, well, it's because you didn't have enough faith. Or here's another view about faith. I had a friend who posted on Facebook one time about the power of positive thinking. It listed all of these wonderful things that she wanted to be true about her life. And then it said, speak things into existence. Neither one of these things are examples of biblical faith. Biblical faith is just that. It's biblical. It's rooted and grounded in the authority and truth claims of the Bible. Hebrews 11, it starts with, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. So living by faith means living as though things that haven't happened, that have been promised by God, are definitely going to happen. It means living your life around the understanding that things that can't be seen are really there. Faith is not imagining what I want to happen, whether it's to have a million dollars appear in my bank account or to have my loved one healed or whatever else we may pray for, both sincerely and frivolously. Faith isn't imagining what I want to happen and then convincing myself that it will. That's not biblical faith. Faith is believing that God is the great physician and he can and he does heal. Faith is believing that God has abundant, endless resources and that he has never left the righteous forsaken, forsaken nor their seed begging bread. Faith is believing that not even a sparrow falls to the ground without God taking note and that means he'll take care of you. And when we exercise genuine faith, we aren't striving to convince ourselves that what we want to happen is going to happen. We are believing specifically what God has said. Nothing more and nothing less. Faith believes what God has said. The faith chapter was written a long time ago. There have been many men and women of faith to, to have lived since then. We've read about them in books. We've heard the stories told over the years. You know, you and I will, will never be in the faith chapter, of course. We might not even ever have books written about us or stories told about us. But we can still live the same life of faith as Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, on down the line. God calls us to be people of faith. Genuine biblical faith that trusts in what God has promised, obeys what God has commanded and believes what God has said. Would you stand with me this morning?